Good evening and welcome to a special edition of 60 Minutes. I'm Tara Brown. Everyone in Australia recognises this beautiful face. Cleo Smith, the little girl who was abducted from her parents' tent at a remote West Australian campsite. For 18 long days and nights, we all held our breath, desperately hoping, though not really believing, she'd be found. But she was, thanks to one of the most meticulous and determined police investigations ever undertaken. Tonight, the untold story of Cleo Smith's kidnapping and rescue, the dramatic new footage and extraordinary new insights which culminated in the happiest four words ever heard from a four-year-old. My name is Cleo. It's 10 degrees at 6 o'clock. Good morning. The man who's confessed to abducting Cleo Smith is set to learn his fate today. We've been waiting for this day. We've been waiting for sentencing. This is the day that he gets justice because of what he's done. Happily, little Cleo Smith is blissfully unaware of the gravity of this day. Terence Kelly pleaded guilty last year to snatching the then four-year-old. He faces up to 20 years behind bars for her abduction. Her parents, Ellie and Jake, are preparing to come face to face with her kidnapper, 37-year-old Terence Kelly. It's been a bruising journey to justice that's taken more than 500 days. So, the emotions? Going to court? Yeah. Terrified. What are you terrified about? Seeing him. I think of Cleo and how scared she was. Knowing that that's who she was looking at, not her parents, not her family, not her sister. It was him, and that's what terrifies me. It was the mystery that confounded and captivated the nation and the world. Missing in the savage landscape of a remote Australian campsite, where was little Cleo Smith? An exhaustive search, on foot and in the air. A tireless investigation. And a daring police raid. Then what seemed impossible, the heart-wrenching rescue. We got her. I got her. Hey, Bobby. Hey, Bobby. Hey, Bobby. Come here. Come here. I've got you, Bobby. What's your name? You're all right. What's your name? What's your name, sweetheart? Um, her name is Cleo. Your name You're is Cleo. Hello, Cleo. Does she ask you questions about those 18 days when she was away from you. Does she talk about it at all? She knows that a bad man took her um, and he's in jail now, so she's safe. Cleo? Cleo, you there? Tonight, what we've never heard before, the trauma of that first frantic morning. Do I have to call her? Hi, um, my daughter's gone missing. How old's your daughter, love? She's four. Ellie Smith's emotional May Day call on October the 16th, 2021, launched the desperate 18 day hunt for her daughter. Where are you there? She's missing and she's missing with her sleeping bag. Can you hear me? Cleo had inexplicably disappeared in the dark of the night from the family tent at the Quabba Blowholes in Northwestern WA. Have we checked everywhere? Yeah, we've done two laps at the place and we grew up here, so we kind of looked everywhere. In those first desperate moments, Ellie and Jake were already contemplating the unthinkable. 
How soon did you believe Cleo was not at the blowholes but that she'd been taken? The second we realised her, like she was gone and her sleeping bag was gone, Yeah, that was the second we knew she did not walk away. There was no drag marks of the sleeping bag. Um, we knew she couldn't have carried it. I mean, we were hoping yeah. she was around the corner and that's, it was just a nightmare, you know. Deep down we knew. We, deep down we knew. She did not walk away. She, she was taken. Within a mere seven minutes of Ellie's triple zero call, police were on their way. For the first time, from their body cameras, we see Ellie's controlled anguish on that terrifying morning. That's our tent just there. Yep. Um, we woke up this morning and let's, she was missing. Yep, let's walk over. Um, she's missing, her sleeping bag's missing, this big thermal um, black and red sleeping bag. Right. Um, quite heavy, I'd have to her carrying it. Cleo had last been seen at 1.30 a.m. in the tent she shared with her parents and baby sister when she'd asked for a drink of water before going back to sleep. When Ellie and Jake woke just after 6 a.m., Cleo okay. was gone. Yeah. So we, we, you, you were both in the tent? Yeah, we're, uh, so we were on uh, the left side. They told me not to go near the yes. tent. Yes, yeah, yeah, leave it. But we, we were on the left side, she was in the right. Um, obviously, we've been around the tent now for the last hour. But yeah, yeah. So is it, is it just you and your partner that, that were here? my two girls. You held it together so well. Yeah, I think I just went into survival mode. Can you describe again? I know you just yeah, did, but just so I can... So I can... Um, got, like, blonde, blonde honey hair. Uh, green eyes. She's in a purple Bonds wonder suit um, with florals. Hang on a second, hang on a second. Sorry. Is there a part of you that's screaming inside, going, please just stop talking to me and go find my daughter? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that was the whole time. Now, um, every question, like, we knew how important it was, so we were trying to help as much as we could, but on the inside we're just like, you know, like, why are you here? Can you please, like, yeah. like go look? Can you go yeah. search? Go yeah. help. <laughs> it's every parent's worst nightmare. Immediately you, you feel and it, it goes to your heart what they had to confront. WA Police Minister Paul Papalia can now reveal the extraordinary seriousness with which Cleo's disappearance was treated right from the very start. The first two officers who responded to that call for a missing child, within four minutes of arrival, had established a crime scene. Why did they do that? They'd listened to Ellie and Jake, and they made that call. And the, and the zipper the zip was open? The zipper was open, and it was open basically like three quarters of the way, and she's quite small and little, like I don't see her opening it the whole way. Yeah. Um, they continued to enact a search for a missing child, but they also concurrently established a crime scene, which is really critical. And from then on, uh, almost every police officer who made a decision regarding this investigation made the right call. So was it such a critical situation that if any of them had made the wrong call, Cleo may not be here today? Very possibly. The police approach was urgent and unrelenting. The scale of what they had to sift through and investigate was mind-boggling. To do it in 18 days was remarkable. For all that time, the assumption was Cleo was alive. It was crucial that they had the mindset that it was an abduction and they were going to find her. They were going to rescue her. I've talked to investigators in that team and they never gave up on the idea that they were seeking to locate and return her to her family. They were yet to know, but the man they were chasing was Terence Kelly from Cleo's hometown of Carnarvon. High on the drug ice, he'd driven an hour north to the campsite in the early hours of the morning with the intent to steal. It took just one unthinkable moment for this petty thief to become a child abductor on the run, snatching Cleo 
as she slept. What were you told was the reason why he did it? What did police say to you about why Terence Kelly took Cleo? It's just... It's disgusting. Carnarvon 1-0, Carnarvon 1-0, this is Calberry 1-0, over. On the day four-year-old Cleo Smith disappeared, SES search leader Steve Cable made a frantic 500-kilometre dash to the Quabba blowholes, an hour north of Carnarvon. Roger, I'm approaching the search area. What is your location, over? Ready to coordinate one of the most intensive manhunts in Australian history. You'd done searches here before. You knew this landscape. When you heard that it was a four-year-old girl lost here... For me, the concern was the ocean, because a little girl that age, if she got that far, uh, yeah. you conjure up in your mind what could have happened. We will do a circular search around the tent site. Steve headed up the we'll search for Cleo effort. alongside Elsa um, Alston, we'll... the SES team leader in Carnarvon. If I was going to search at 150 from here, that's the bearing I go on. What lay before them was the daunting terrain around the Quabba campsite. What drove them was the face of little Cleo. How worried were you? Quite worried. I think you try and buoy yourself up with, we'll be out there searching for a day and we'll find her. You know, that's, that's what you cling on to. Day after day, up to 60 SES volunteers formed the front line in a gruelling battle against time to find the little girl. This is really where it all began. This is the campsite. Yeah. Still chills me. What was it like when you got here? Um, it was eerily quiet. Um, it had gone from that initial chaos where there were people frantically looking everywhere they could uh, to this cordoned off site. So you just stood as a sort of a bit of a, a beacon um, to remind us why we're all here, really. Did you get a sense while you were there how invested, how emotionally invested some of these volunteers were? I mean, some of them were our closest friends. They were out there doing everything they could day in, day out, and they were still coming back with no, no outcome, no results, um, no matter how much they tried. But she wasn't there. The greatest fear for those searching for Cleo was that they wouldn't find her in time. But as the hours stretched into days, the universal conclusion was that she hadn't fallen from these treacherous cliffs, nor was she lying unfound under some salt bush. It was clear Cleo was not here. But that offered no comfort, for the alternative, that she'd been snatched by a stranger, was far more terrifying. Five days in marked a new, devastating reality for Ellie and Jake. Cleo could not be found. The search at the blowholes was officially over. It was time to go home. I think that was the hardest part for me, was watching the entourage leave, um, knowing that their child seat was empty, and as a parent, I thought, I don't, I don't know how you do that, how you summon the strength to, to leave this place where you had your child with you last. Yeah, I just I watched them leave and I had to sort of have a quiet moment to myself at that point. <laughs> yeah. One terrifying door shut and a bigger terrifying door opened. 
and she was taken. Someone came and took her and that door was the only door then. It was just terrible. With the SES search over, 140 police were now on the hunt for Cleo and her abductor. Police from Carnarvon and Perth, detectives, forensics and data analysts were feverishly working around the clock. Police Minister Paul Papalia was across every aspect of this immense investigation. There was a massive amount of data that had to be assessed and analysed. There were tens of thousands of hours of CCTV imagery from service stations, from private houses, from small businesses within a thousand kilometre radius. They deployed officers to search rubbish bins to eliminate potential evidence. And searching vehicles and, and yeah. people driving through. I mean, it just meant that every thread, potential thread, was looked at, it would seem. Yeah. So in the site itself, there were 110 campers. There had been people by the time the police arrived who would departed um, and others who had arrived. It was just a massive volume of information to sift through. As the police investigation would ultimately reveal, Terence Kelly was a man on a mission, having left Carnarvon for the campsite in the dead of the night. What have police told you about his movements? I mean, you, you were all sleeping, you thought safely, in your tent. He was on drugs and he was coming to... Still stuff. Still, yes, still from cars or shacks. That's all he was there for and... He opened our tent and she was there. So he just swept her up and put her in the car. And did police tell you the journey he then took? He went the dirt track home. Yeah. To avoid be detected, being yeah. detected. He turned his phone off so no one knew he was there. He took the dirt track home. Um, the plan was in action then. But Terence Kelly had made a monumental error, one that would break open the case and ultimately lead to him being identified as a suspect. Somewhere along his journey, at 3.05 a.m., he turned his phone back on, registering a solitary ping with this mobile phone tower. How critical was this bit of technology in identifying Terence Kelly as a potential suspect? Yeah, it's pretty striking. This tower was the site that recorded thousands of phones, hundreds of thousands of data sets, and in that captured one bit of information that led to the investigation of Kelly as the, as the suspect. So that put him on the list? Yes, amongst a lot of other people and a, a lot of uh, information but it was ultimately the start of, of that thread of investigation. By a sheer quirk of fate, it was just 2018 when the new tower was built a short distance from the campsite. It was the stroke of luck that changed everything. Once they got that ping, that really opened up a window into the life of Terence Kelly for police. Yes, having got that ping um, from that device, it gave the police that starting point. How would the police have approached... Telecommunications it? engineer really Professor Mark Gregory at Melbourne's RMIT says that single ping revealed a treasure trove of secrets. Was that a eureka moment for police? Yes, most certainly was. The tower at the blowholes didn't just identify the phone operated by Terence Kelly, through detailed data analysis, it yielded so much more. So the information from the phone tells is not just about where the phone is, it's about how the phone has been used. Yes, they get information about what websites, what applications have been running and other information that can help create a picture about, you know, the individual that's using that device. Uh, and so all of these little breadcrumbs uh, helps the police put together a picture and, and eventually that picture leads them to, uh, to the suspect. But tracking down Cleo's kidnapper was far from easy. The tower was like a data magnet. 
And so police had to sort through, rule out and prioritise a mountain of complex information. From one tower, they would have hundreds of thousands of data sets. This man was a needle in a haystack. That's right. In retrospect, people think this was obvious. It's only obvious after they've removed all the other clutter, the hundreds of thousands of leads that were wrong, then it becomes clear. Terence Kelly was in the sights of police. Cleo's 18-day ordeal was about to come to an end. But only now the extent of her torment can be shared. Do you feel anger when you hear that? Yeah. Of course. I mean, you know, someone's tied our child yeah, up. Someone's, and someone's hurt our kid. Like, we are angry and we'll always be angry. For nearly three weeks, the eyes of the world were on the isolated town of Carnarvon in Western Australia, as it searched and grieved for little Cleo. It must have been a huge disruption at the time. It was a significant impact on our town. And the amount of people that actually got on board and tried to help during the search, yep. it was just, it was out, absolutely out of control. Like so many here, Shire President Eddie Smith was convinced that Cleo had been taken by an outsider. To learn that the perpetrator of this was from within the Carnarvon community, not just the little girl, but the man who did this to her, how, what was that like? It was a shock, absolute shock. Um, it was, the entire town was, this doesn't happen in our town. Yeah, and it, it's, Carnarvon's our home. This sort of thing happens in the rest of the world, not, not in Carnarvon. Back in those dark days of Cleo's disappearance, Mum and Dad, Ellie and Jake, endured the most excruciating waiting game. With the search over, they could do nothing else but appeal on social media for help. Every day is getting hard without my shining bright light. Today she's missed Halloween with her family. She needs us and we need her I need my baby girl home, please, I beg you. Millions read Ellie's heartbreaking pleas, including, as we now know, Terence Kelly. It was basically um, commenting, saying, whoever has her to return her and he had her. Yeah. He knew that we were begging for our daughter back. He was responding to us begging and... Did nothing, yeah. He did nothing. He would go home every night knowing that he had her. While he was cruelly playing with them, what Kelly didn't know was that police were closing in. Detectives amassed information from various government agencies, from Kelly's social media use to his phone data and criminal history. The complex threads of a determined investigation were coming together. But Police Minister Paul Papalia can now reveal there were other potential culprits, but as each was ruled out, Kelly's name rose to the top of the suspect list. It began as a massive wide spectrum of investigation and narrowed and narrowed and narrowed and just prior to his arrest, they became more focused on him. The WA police hunt for Cleo spanned an extraordinary 1,000 kilometre radius, but for the entire 18 days she was missing, Cleo was here, locked inside Terence Kelly's house. The four-year-old was breathtakingly close to those who were searching for her the hardest, a mere two-minute drive from the Carnarvon police station, just over three kilometres from her home, from her desperate mum and dad. Within hours of Kelly being identified as the prime suspect, detectives were ready to swoop. Even then, the situation was so fluid, they didn't know where Cleo was, whether she was alive or dead, 
or even if they had the right man. But the risk of waiting was too great. On Tuesday, November the 2nd, 2021, they sat off Kelly's house, watched him leave, and then, just before midnight, pulled him over. What sparked the police to arrest him in the manner in which they did, which was away from the house, he was driving? It was planned for the early hours of the next day, but um, it was brought forward because of the erratic nature of his behaviour. He was driving erratically. They couldn't anticipate what he was about to do. They could potentially fear that he would try and evade them and get away. What was it like to learn that they swooped on Terence Kelly within hours of learning that he was the prime suspect. I mean, we, we had no idea. They were fast, they were efficient. Yeah. Um, the second that they got details in, like, they, they jumped, yeah. they, they acted, they did what they needed to do. It's the right call. They made the right call under difficult circumstances. And you know, thank goodness uh, Cleo was in that house. It was the most precious moment that touched the world because so many feared it would never come. Cleo was alive. Remarkably, she'd been hidden in plain sight. Can you come to terms with how close she was to you for all that time? It, no. No, when the police called and said, we have her, I was like, well, where are you? And they're like, oh, at the hospital. I'm like, yeah, but where? Um, they're like, no, in, in Carnarvon, like in emergency. And I was like, what? There was no way I thought it was anyone in Carnarvon that did it. I mean, that town's our home, um, the community's like our family. Ugh. We grew up there, I was born there, and someone that lived there and grew there was the person that did it. Since Cleo's rescue, much more has come to light about Terence Kelly's motivations. A troubled man, he was a meth addict and a loner, who mostly dwelled in a bizarre, imaginary world shared with Bratz dolls and a fake online family. What were you told was the reason why he did it? What did police say to you about why Terence Kelly took clear? He had his fantasies and he was trying to make them come to life. You know, he wanted a daughter, he wanted a wife and he had all this these different Facebook pages set up to be his family. He already had that in action, but he needed it in real life. So he had to make that come to life. Um, it just happened to be that it was our tent that he got into. So he was fulfilling a fantasy of, of having a real little... Yeah. Yeah. He wanted a little girl that was a little doll. Looked like one of his dolls, yeah. Um, it's just, it's disgusting. Once caught, Terence Kelly admitted his crimes, immediately confessing to how he treated Cleo during her 18 days locked in his home tying up the four-year-old with sticky tape and, as he described it, roughing her up when she dared to ask for chocolate. Disturbing evidence Ellie and Jake had to sit through in court. Listening to the details of him having, you know, a roughed Cleo up, having tied her with tape, those details, that must have been harrowing to listen to. I mean, it's just, it's disgusting to hear that someone's, like, capable of doing that to a child, let alone our child. Um, you know, Cleo is so innocent and she is such a ball of sunshine. 
it's just heartbreaking. Despite Terence Kelly's delusional, drug-addled state of mind, there is no doubt he knew what he was doing. He changed the locks on the bedroom door where Cleo was held, and he even turned on the radio to drown out her cries for her parents. We heard in court that Cleo had heard her name on the radio, the uh -huh. radio that had been set up to disguise her crying out for you. Yeah. What was that like to hear in court? Obviously it it hurts to know that she was crying out for help and we weren't there. Um, it hurts to know that she was crying out for help and... It's ignored, yeah? It was ignored. Yeah. Do you feel yeah. anger when you hear that? Yeah. Of course. I mean, you know, someone's tied our child yeah, up. Someone's hurting your someone's, baby. Someone's, you know, tied them up with sticky tape. Someone's hurt our kid, like... We are angry and we'll always be angry, but we've also got to keep moving forward for Cleo. Front of mind always is Cleo's well-being. Her recovery, a day-to-day -day challenge for this courageous young family. I mean, we have hard days just like Cleo has nightmares, but we've also got to, you know, put on that brave face for Cleo. They were just like, you know, red dirt um, and gorges and it was so stunning. And then there's... A night around the campfire with Jake and Ellie Smith and their love of the outdoors is infectious. Everywhere we went to was so beautiful. It just made us realise how beautiful Australia really is. But in the immediate aftermath of Cleo's extraordinary rescue, they embraced it like they'd never done before, taking their daughters on a great escape around Australia. Feel like what was the anticipation like getting on the road behind the wheel for the first time? It was scary. Obviously, we'd never really travelled. Travel, yeah. um, neither of us have ever done such a thing. Even though it was scary, it was just what ne we needed to do. You don't know? On an adventure? On an adventure. And first up, X-Mouth. X-Mouth! Woohoo! <laughs> it was a four-month adventure that took Cleo and her little sister Isla far from Carnarvon. A road trip to remember to help them all forget the horror of Cleo's 18-day kidnapping ordeal. Was packing up and leaving running away? Um, not running away, just, I guess, trying to find us again um, as a family. So it was nice. I think it was, it was a great... No, it was good to get out. Yeah, it was, it was a great decision. And we were able to find ourselves again um, after trauma. Cleo strikes me as a girl who's always in a hurry. Always. <laughs> Look, as long as she's running, jumping, dancing, she's happy. Here she goes. <laughs> yeah. Cool. She does have a lot of good days. Um, she's such a happy little girl. <laughs> as happy as Cleo is, she remains a little girl changed by her kidnapping. Being cocooned with her family on their caravanning holiday, love and reassurance was the perfect antidote. We were just in such a small space and I think that was what she needed, having us all there. Did she express needs that you hadn't heard before? You know, like, please don't leave me alone or I want to sleep with the lights on or... Yeah, definitely. Yes. Um, we had to make sure she felt safe and she felt yeah. comfortable. She was always a really independent little girl. Like, she would love sleeping by herself. She would love her own space, her own area. Um, and now she's a lot more with us, um, which is great. We, we don't mind. Yeah. Um, we love a snuggle. Can I see, Mum? You can only imagine the fear Cleo felt when she was kidnapped and held by Terence Kelly. 
18 days that would have felt like a lifetime for this little girl. Even the love and protection of her family can't erase the terror that still plagues Cleo in her most unguarded moments. She still has her sad nights, her nightmare nights, um, some things she just can't explain. Yeah, what are the sad nights about? What, what is she sad about? She doesn't have the words to explain what she's sad about. Um, she just knows that's how she feels. Um, so they're just sad nights. Her nightmare nights are the worst nights. Yeah. yeah. And they still happen? Yeah. Yeah. How frequently? Oh, every week. Must be hard to see a little girl scared. Yeah. What do you do to try to make her feel safer? Um, yeah, give her cuddles, yeah. Reassure her that everything's fine. Sneak her a few chocolates. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She's got your measure. <laughs> That's it, yeah. The 4th of April this year was a landmark day for Cleo's nervous parents, Ellie and Jake. We've been waiting for this day. We've been waiting for sentencing. The day Terence Kelly would finally learn his fate for kidnapping their daughter. It's like this big ball of anger that's been building up every day and once I hear them dates, I'm hoping, <laughs> I'm hoping I can let go of that anger. It didn't take long for Chief Judge Julie Wager to sum up the pain Terence Kelly inflicted on Cleo and her family. The fear and distress caused to them over those 18 days was immeasurable. The child's life and that of her family has been permanently impacted and that impact will never go away. She sentenced Kelly to 13 and a half years for child stealing. Despite reliving the details of his awful crime, just as they have throughout, Ellie and Jake maintained their dignity. We have Cleo, we have our family together and we try not to dwell on him and um, the bad bits of what happened. Obviously we're still um, sad, hurt, scared, uh, angry, terrified, <laughs> um, but we, we try not to let it rule our life. So it is hard talking about him and what happened because we don't want that to be our sole purpose of our emotions. Cleo Smith's kidnapping changed the lives of so many especially those who sacrificed so much to try to find her. For Elsa and Steve from the SES, Cleo's extraordinary rescue was a moment like no other. Still gives me goosebumps. I actually was woken up to the news and um, people's, well, my phone was pinging. Yes. Uh, what, my, what, what, what. my husband came upstairs and was shouting and I think I could, my neighbours probably still heard the, the yelling and the screaming. I thought, oh, my God. It's just, it's just incredible. Absolute jubilation. Just the best day around town. People put up signs. I know the SES unit, we went down and the, everyone bought whatever fairy lights they had. We made a sign. <laughs> Sounds so lovely, fairy lights and signs. I thought you might go to the pub. <laughs> we did. We, oh, did. You did that we too. Did. Oh, we we did that too. <laughs> <laughs> we did that too. Yeah, yeah. And, and all the town was out. Everybody was out. Um, you just needed to be out together and everybody had to share it. Yeah. 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 Yes, yes. Yeah, all the volunteers. They were incredible. Yeah. Our town, um, you know, it's always going to be our town. We don't live there anymore, but it's always our home. You know, to the police, they've done everything. They still do. You know, they go beyond their job. Everyone helped us in so many different ways. Um, we're so grateful for that. Cleo clearly relishes being home, back with her family. For all that she endured, nothing can dampen her insatiable lust 
for life. Can you ever say no to her? <laughs> <laughs> Look, it took a bit. Yeah. <laughs> it took a bit to say no, but we, uh, yeah. we do. I mean, we still need to treat her yeah. um, normal. She Hello. has school. She loves her school. She loves ballet. She's just starting tap and she wants to do horse riding. She has so much to live for. She's five and she's such a vibrant little soul. We're grateful for having our little girl home. Hello, I'm Tara Brown. Thanks for watching 60 Minutes Australia. Subscribe to our channel now for brand new stories and exclusive clips every week. And don't miss out on our Extra Minutes segments and full episodes of 60 Minutes on 9now.com.au and the 9now app.